This episode is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements, the leader in digestive health for dogs, cats, and horses. Hello and welcome to Chats with the Chatfield. This is a podcast to expand your idea of what impacts veterinarians, pet owners, and basically all animal lovers in the galaxy is humans. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And if you have not yet subscribed to our show, why not? Just go to chatfieldshow.com and subscribe today. And if you want to reach us, you can find me with any message of love and positivity at jen at chatfieldshow.com. Or if you want to get real, you can find me at jason at chatfieldshow.com. Okay, into the chat room today, we're going to be talking about one of actually my favorite topics. Um, It is all about why dogs cough. Jason, are you ready? Are you, ex- I'm re- you seem excited? I'm, re- I'm, re- I'm super excited. I'm always excited, but I'm even more excited because of our guest today. I know we have a great guest, so let's yeah. get him on in here. Joining us again, because he is a friend of the show, joining us again is Dr. Richard Stone, who is a board-certified veterinary internist and also um, serving right now. He is the vice president of medicine for Blue Pearl Let's see. We we just call it Blue Pearl. We shorten it, but it's what is it? Blue Pearl Animal Health. Blue Pearl. Give it to Pet me, Hospital. Richard. Blue Pearl Pet Hospital. Blue Pearl Pet Hospital. That's right. I thought and it was you... Blue Pearl saves all pets. No, is that not? I've been I... saying it wrong. All right. We try. We try. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's fantastic. We do. We do try, don't we? All of us. Um, some days Jason tries more than others, but <laughs> <Those> days are rare. <laughs> Anyway, everyone else should also know, fair disclosure, that Richard and Dr. Jason were in vet school together, if you don't already know that. Which Founding means- members of GOTM. GOTM. And Anders, Dr. Anders Colhavy, another friend of the show. You should check out his episode if you haven't already about a veterinarian in Hong Kong. Um, they were the founding members of GOTM. I just said that. But, but I'm, glad you- that we re- I'm glad that we repeated it because it's important to know. You left out Anders. Vice President of Medicine, Blue Pearl. All right. Founding <laughs> member of GOTM. That's what it should say on his LinkedIn. That'll probably get him more traction in the world. I'll update. I'll update. Yeah, yes, he's he's going to update right. that. Okay. All right. So, uh, but let's, let's talk about it because I think it's one of the most common complaints we hear um, from pet owners, or at least I do. Um, they'll come into the ER for it. They'll come into the uh, regular general practice for it. They have to come into the specialty hospital for it. The coughing dog. Um, yeah. So, what do you think about when you hear someone's there to be seen because their dog is coughing, Dr. Stone? What goes through your head? You know, there's a few ways we can think about it, but I'll tell you, sometimes dogs cough and it doesn't have to be a big deal. If it's a transient, like they coughed a few times and it resolved because they were eating and they got something caught back in their pharynx, kind of in the back of their mouth, or they were eating grass and they gag a little bit after doing that, that's not a disaster, right? That's okay. <laughs> Persistent cough, however, that can indicate some sort of health problem. So- okay. We, we got to differentiate what's causing that whenever we see that, okay, this isn't just two or three coughs and it's going away, but it's continuing to happen throughout the day. So when you're looking at the frequency or like for, I guess, the duration, the chronicity of that cough, how long they've been coughing, uh, because we do, we have, we have clients, you know, pet owners that will call and say, my dog coughed. Do I need to bring him in? What do I do? You know, and I'm like, I don't like, did it just cough like the one time? <laughs> you yeah. know, so what, I guess what constitutes in your mind or how do you describe that for clients when the cough is legit and needs to be seen? I, I asked kind of the question you just said, which is like, okay, did this just happen once and it's resolved or is, are we continuing to cough? And if we're continuing to cough, like even within one day, I would say, well, we probably need to be seen because um, there's a lot of things that cause an acute cough, meaning a, a cough of relatively short duration that we want to sort out. Some of those things can be contagious, so we need to sort that out. And there's a different category that we would call a chronic cough, where you get beyond, say, two weeks of coughing. We start thinking about other, um, what we call differentials, other disease processes that can cause that to happen that we diagnose and treat in a totally different way. Okay. All right. So let's let's focus. Let, let's kind of take this in in a stepwise fashion. So sure. how about how about those acute cough. So when, when I, when you say acute cough, like to me, I feel like that's, they've been coughing for like maybe a couple days. Yeah. Right. right. Would that be how you would see that as well? That's right. And here's what typically happens. Someone calls in, says my dog's coughing. We get them in to be seen. And when it's an acute cough like that, there's a few things that are, that we're thinking about immediately top of mind. Um, 
we always start with a physical exam and a history though, right? So we ask all the questions related to how long has it been going on? Did anything happen prior to the cough, during the cough, any other symptoms of illness, right? Mm -hmm. Then we also have to consider things like the, the patient's age because surprise, there's, there's some infectious diseases that, that younger dogs might be more likely to encounter in their environment. We got to think about all of that. And then we do no, a physical exam. Wait a minute, I got to interrupt for a second. Huh? Right, Jason, did you just hear Richard, Dr. Stone, did he? Did he say that old age is a disease? He almost said that. I Did I he hear it? That. Yeah, I heard I it. I said specifically that young age might get you in more trouble sometimes. Yeah, old age <laughs> is a disease. That's what we heard. What are you talking about? That's exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. what we said. <laughs> okay, you know, okay. The, the age thing's a good point to bring up though, right? Because if we think about it, there's certain, and people may not know this, there's certain intestinal parasites that when young puppies get them, migrate through the lungs on their way to get to the intestines. And that can actually cause a little bit of a cough as well. Now you're probably going to see other symptoms, but when we think about all the things that can impact the lungs and the airways in younger dogs, we, we do worry about things like parasites and infectious conditions. Okay. And when I say infectious, I mean, bacteria, viruses, things like that, that we actually usually vaccinate for mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that young puppies might not still encounter those diseases. Right. So when, when I hear that a, a dog has been acutely coughing so it's been going on for maybe a day maybe a couple of days not two weeks or more but 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 short short order like that i start trying to run down the list of okay could this be something infectious or traumatic one of those things that comes on relatively quickly that we need to diagnose and treat um in particular if it's infectious because if it's infectious it means it could be contagious mm -hmm. i have a question and, yeah. and it's it, everything i ask usually pertains to me Right. So this is all I care about is me. So Dr. Stone, <clears throat> my first question is none of those. Okay. okay. My first question is, can you demonstrate it for me? Now, is that a terrible question to ask a client or am, am I just being silly? Cause then I record it. Right. And then I used it for, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah. I, I, I ask, Hey, what does it sound like? Can you go ahead and demonstrate it for me? Uh, um, and a lot of people kind of laugh at it, but I think it may be an important question. Not all coughs are created equal. Is that, is that a true statement or is that completely false? It, no, that's actually very true. It's a good, it's a good question. And um, I thought you were asking me to demonstrate it at first. No, I will later though. I will. <laughs> uh, no, but, you know, in the exam room. So the physical exam portion of things, you know, what we were talking about earlier is like, what's already running through my mind when I hear yeah. the history of a dog having an acute cough, whether they're a younger dog or some, in some cases, an older dog that's say been boarding or has been around a, a lot of other dogs at the dog yeah. park or something like that. There's certain infectious diseases I think about. When we do our physical exam, we're trying to localize the cough. Basically mm -hmm. what we do is we do a complete exam to make sure we're not missing anything else. We don't want to miss any other conditions or, or symptoms, but then we do things like we, we actually palpate. We feel the, the larynx and the trachea to see if there's mm -hmm. sensitivity there. We listen to the lungs to see if there's abnormal sounds down low. Um, we, we try to understand when they cough, is it more of a harsh, what we call an upper airway cough where they like cough and gag, or is it a, a lower airway cough, which sometimes can be a little bit softer um, and um, you can sometimes sort of hear it down in their thoracic wall right. when you're listening with a stethoscope. You can hear something down in their lungs. Mm. When we localize a cough like that, it's actually very important because there are certain things that I do not expect to hear. If, let's say this is a simple, what we call infectious tracheobronchitis, meaning I've got a little bit of kennel cough. I expect that the trachea, the upper airway is going to be a little bit sensitive. We probably cough and gag a bit whenever we cough, right? I hope to not hear... Uh, fluid sounds or, or harsh lung sounds down low because that Why might not? yeah well then that means maybe it's not just a simple upper yeah. airway irritation from a, a, no. a bacterial viral infection but maybe it's lower in the lungs i do have to interrupt for just a second because i think i heard a banned phrase i know i knew i'm surprised you didn't stop him right away i know but if he was on a roll and it was all such good stuff i just I loved know. it you never want to interrupt dr stone when he gets rolling no just let him roll. no right. he's a stone so rolling down the hill yeah. what is it that's right. So we have a banned phrase here in the chat room. Um, we have banned the phrase kennel cough. Mm -hmm. Yes. More specifically, um, Dr. Jen has banned the phrase. Kennel I, cough. I don't, I don't, I want to make that very clear. I Jen. have, but, but let, let, okay. So, so we're going to focus on that. So remember folks, we're still talking about those acute coughs that are just a couple days in duration, less than two weeks for sure. Mm -hmm. And most often um, uh, we find those in those younger dogs that are social. Like he mentioned, they get boarded. Oh, yeah. They see other dogs or social dogs. So if your dog has a calendar that's busier than yours, you might have a social dog. Yeah. So uh, when, when we talk about kennel cough, cause I know right now, every single well, pet owner's 
I know. I'm, but I'm using it to discuss it as, ah, as itself, okay. right? right? So it's fair. Um, okay. Every single pet owner's ears- As long as you ears, make the rules, it's fine. Like, like, well, of course I do. Every single pet owner's ears perked up because they're like, wait, what? Because everybody has heard of the dreaded kennel cough. And the reason it's a banned phrase in the chat room is because, A, we now know, and now dog lifestyles, you don't actually have to put your dog in a kennel for them yeah. to be exposed and potentially infected with some of the, the pathogens, the viruses, the bacteria that mm -hmm. combine to produce that clinical syndrome. And in fact, now we don't call it kennel cough. If you want to appear learned in your social circles, right, you call it canine infectious respiratory disease complex, CIRDC, or just mm -hmm. a coffin dog. So mm -hmm. um, I know I know Dr. Stone just had a momentary lapse there. <laughs> and so No, so he, Do Dr. Stone just wants to sound like a normal person and doesn't want to have <laughs> all, all, all those words rolling off his tongue. Listen, semantics you, are so important. You do bring okay. up a good point. Now, now, granted, for a lot of clients, the 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 historical terminology of kennel cough is well known, but you bring up a great point, and that is there, there's actually been an evolution too in, in what some of the pathogens are that dogs are exposed to. Go back to 2000 and pre 2004, let's say, right? What was what? not on the radar? Then? That's a long time ago. The, Dr. No, Stone. no, no. no oh, what yeah, y'all were y'all were still in school. I was out, but that was the founding year. We didn't year talk about canine you know. flu, right? We didn't we, talk well, about H3N2, no. did we? No, well, we didn't talk about canine influenza, but even more importantly, people were still thinking that coughing dogs were because of a single pathogen infection oh, yeah. called yeah, sure. Bordetella. And right. and now we know Bordetella is not even in the top three right. most often producing that coughing dog. Like you got to go pretty far down the list to get to Bordetella. But what mm -hmm. do clients always come in asking for? I need my dog's Bordetella vaccination. Mm -hmm. And and I say, do you? Do you? No. Let me help you. What you need is the vaccination against upper respiratory infection. Mm -hmm. um, because Bordetella is um, really kind of a bit player. That's right. And you, you bring a good point too, that often th th this is one of those unique scenarios where you can have a multifaceted infection. Some of the organisms that are grown in pets, whenever, so if we do a, a let's say a sampling of a dog with um, one of these upper respiratory disease complex type coughs, right? We think it's an acute infection. So we think mm -hmm. they caught something and we, we go and screen them with say PCR testing, things will pop up on some of that testing that we're not even quite sure what we should do with. Like yeah. how interpret this. So if I grow, say, one of the organisms is called mycoplasma. Right. Or or even a pneumovirus now, like that's the, the big one yeah. running yeah, around. That, you know, but it, it it demonstrates what you said, Jim, which is like there's complexity, even in something as simple as an infection, it could be multiple pathogens or multiple organisms in there contributing to that cough. But mm -hmm. that's one of many reasons why a young dog can cough. Like there's so many other things, but I'll tell you what I find to be Diagnosed it a few times, but it's probably one of the least common causes of cough. Um, oftentimes when dogs are coughing very harshly because of that upper respiratory disease complex, uh, that infectious condition, people are concerned that they're choking on something, that they've inhaled something and they're choking on it. Yeah. It does happen. I, I have used a bronchoscope to pull acorns out of a dog's trachea on more than one occasion. It happens occasionally. It's exceedingly, exceedingly rare. So more often than not, when they have that harsh cough, very sensitive trachea. It's usually not because they're quote unquote choking on something. It's, it's usually something else. Yeah. That, and that's very, that's very interesting. All right. So um, now we know to beware of acorns if we didn't know already, <laughs> which is awesome. Like I can't and believe you, you actually And if you have that. an acorn problem, we know who to call. Dr. Holy Richard moly. Yeah. yeah. The most Dr. Richard in the entire Stone. country. Exceedingly rare. Exceedingly rare. Yeah, it, it, it is. But, you, but it's a good point because people often think their dog is choking and, and they're not, even though it seems like they're trying to hack something up. Right. They're trying to cough out fluid that is in their lungs, but they're not going to they can't cough it out. It's not available to be coughed. Um, okay. So, OK, so we know that um, a lot of times it's an infectious cause for that acute cough of less than two weeks duration and typically in younger dogs. But luckily, and I'm just going to put like put a button on the acute cough and say we could prevent that. Oh, yeah, that's right? true. Now. I want to call something out. There's one other very important cause of acute cough. It's actually a chronic condition, but it will present acutely with cough. We've been talking about airway disease the whole time, like trachea, lungs, you know, the, the, where the air moves through to oxygenate your body. Let's not for, forget about um, cardiac disease. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, that's 
to me, that is when a cough is not just a cough. There is, you go. is when it, it involves, like we start talking about other systems and, and that sort of thing. So, so let's just, we're going to wrap up our acute cough here because that's truly well, me, an acute Hold on, don't, don't wrap cough. it up yet. This is okay, cough. Wait. And another, yeah. listen again, all about me. Uh, so another question I always ask or, or try to differentiate, especially over the phone. And maybe this is wrong. I like to be told I'm wrong. That's what I do. Uh, productive, non-productive, wet, dry. So are these acute mm. sort of uh, infectious Good. upper respiratory disease coughs, are they more of a dry kind of cough? A wet cough, productive cough. Uh, how else could you characterize it? And this is just for the non, maybe the non-veterinarian always like the the non-veterinarian um, folks we have out there that have dogs. They can help more accurately describe the cough um, uh, to their veterinarian because it's probably going to be over the phone, right? Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where, hey, should I come in or, mm-hmm. or not? And it's going to be one of the questions you ask, Doctor Stone. You're going to have to ask it, and and maybe they need to know kind of what what that means. So when I'm asking dry, wet, productive, non-productive. What am I asking? So I think what you're asking there, when you talk about cough, you're, you're asking the, the client, the, the pet owner right. to describe, does, is something brought up whenever they cough? Because like if, if we see something like um, mucus or a blood right. tinge or something like that, sometimes that can indicate a, a kind of an upper airway um, type issue, sometimes with deeper pneumonias. So right. something yeah. d- deeper is more, more serious often. Um, they might have, um, this sounds really gross, but purulent exudate, which means like infectious material that can be coughed up. That's called pus. Yeah, it's, called pus. Pus. it's pus. I want pus to sounds it. gross. Purulent exudate it sounds, sounds very smart. Yeah, and then and then sometimes in dogs with, with, say, heart conditions, they will present acutely with cough at times. Mm-hmm. It is possible for them to produce fluid when they cough, but I want to just warn everybody. There's a lot of dogs that have any one of these conditions and they don't produce anything. So like that can happen. So it's fine to right. ask question but i think we, we got to keep in mind that for some dogs even if they are producing something coughing something up they swallow it and you never see right it. right and okay, I, I, like, I would agree like the truly productive cough like we think of with people it just just, just really doesn't happen with dogs in our like we're not going to perceive that you can't right? see it right yeah. yeah they they don't they don't they don't hawk up a lung you know like right. they just right. they just cough and cough and cough so all right so so acute cough young dog less than two weeks duration most of the time we're looking for an infectious cause. And this is just, if if you needed a sign right now, like to get your dog up to date on their upper respiratory um, vaccination, this is it. Consider this it. You now have permission, in fact, encouragement, get your dog vaccinated for upper respiratory disease. Um, and we're going to take a short break, but then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about those those coughing dogs that are not acute necessarily they may look that way they may uh you may think they just started coughing but maybe it's more chronic and it's going to be a bigger when a cough just isn't just a cough all right we'll be right back with all the fuss happening in the pet food industry why not invest in something to help guard against digestive health arrangements in your pet full buckets probiotics are formulated by veterinarians to support your pet's normal digestive health Your pet's gut microbiome is integral to their immune system performance. Why not add Full Bucket's daily dog or daily cat probiotic powder to your pet's daily routine to curate, protect, maintain, and strengthen your pet's microbiome? Visit fullbuckethelp.com today to check out all of their veterinary strength supplements. Okay, so we're back. So we have um, talked about, uh, we we had a coughing break. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so we. Hey. I'm come sorry. On, that Dr. was very Jason. funny. Good job. I'm sorry. That was great. I love it. Good job. Wow. Okay. I mean, Dr. Stone, he doesn't change, does he? No. No. <laughs> He's uh, still uh, the same. It's okay. It's well, okay. I would have laughed if it was funny. Anyway. Let's Holy move on. moly! It's a tough room today <laughs> in the chat room. But uh, thanks for hanging with us. So we're back with Dr. Richard Stone, Vice President of Medicine for Blue Pearl um, Animal Hospitals. Blue Pearl Veterinary Hospital. I'm never going to get it right. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because we just call them Blue Pearl. Uh, but we're so excited that he's joining us because he's a super smarty. Um, he is a boarded veterinary internal specialist, so an internist. And we are talking about when a cough isn't just a cough. So we've talked about those acute coughs. And as a reminder, less than two weeks, typically of duration, usually much shorter, a couple of days, up to two weeks. Usually that's fine. We find that in younger dogs. So I'm going to say like two or three-year-old dogs or younger. Um, and 
Now, if it's not one of those largely infectious causes, if it's not just upper airway, um, look, what are we, what are we looking at there? How, how does that, how does that cough or that presentation in the exam room differ? Sure. Good question. So there's some other things that we might consider, and this is where, you know, we could categorize based on breed, size of dog, there's certain things that we might see more frequently, but there's a few things that I want to call out across the United States and other parts of the globe. There are um, other infectious conditions that we commonly see that can eventually result in a cough for a number of different reasons. One being heartworm disease. Okay. Oh yeah. Patients can get heartworm infection. It's actually not in their lungs so much as the arteries in their lungs, but that can lead to inflammation and, and symptoms well beyond just a cough. Okay. So I want to call that out when you were making a plug for, um, uh, ensuring that your pets are vaccinated. Um, I think making a plug for ensuring that if you're in a heartworm endemic area, that you're aware of that, you've talked to your veterinarian about that, and you're, you're managing for the, that risk appropriately. So okay, people, that. he's going all around it. Just get your dog on heartworm prevention. Right. Okay, right. that's it. It's really easy. It's much cheaper than treating the disease and it's way better oh, yeah. for your pet. So just put them on heartworm prevention. Put okay, prevention. that's right. Good point. Now, if we're dealing with, say, a more, a more chronic type of cough, there's a few different diseases that I, I would definitely want us to consider, but I just want to remind again, if it's short duration cough, even if it's not a younger dog, let's say an older dog, 13 year old dog, 12 year old dog, in certain breeds too, if they're coughing and it sounds not like the typical harsh cough, but maybe they've been breathing faster than normal. And um, they're maybe a little lethargic or slower with respect to their, their activity. And now they've got this cough and, and, and maybe it's even a soft cough. We still want to get that checked out because some dogs over time develop cardiac disease that can lead to cardiac failure. And what I mean by that is for a number of reasons, whether it's the muscle portion of the heart pumping or it's the valves in the heart that are supposed to be sealed and then they start leaking, if that happens, pressure builds up in the lungs and fluid can leak out into the, the, the parts of the lungs that are supposed to be filled with air. And that can result in fast, rapid breathing, uh, coughing as well can happen. And although that happens quickly from the standpoint of the cough coming on, You'll, you'll just notice suddenly one day we're coughing. The condition's been brewing under the surface for um, goodness, probably years. And in particular, if you have a dog that is say a Doberman, they can be prone to certain conditions like dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart gets bigger and weaker over time. That's called the basketball heart, Jason. Do you remember that from I, school? I'm, I'm listening to Dr. Stone, please it carry on. Dr. Giant Stone. basketball heart. Yeah. Now I also want to call out, there's a lot of small breed dogs that have what we call a, a heart murmur. There's a leak in the, in the, off in the mitral valve, one of the valves in the heart, and it makes this noise when we listen with our stethoscope, this abnormal noise. Not every dog with a heart murmur ends up having heart failure, but it's an important piece of information to know so that if, if, if the murmur is getting louder over time and your veterinarian tells you that, and then one day, a year down the road, your dog starts having a bit of a soft cough, Let's not ignore it. Let's get them into the veterinarian and get that checked. What do you, What do you mean? I'm not asking you to to demonstrate by any means, but what do you mean by soft cough versus the harsh cough? Well, I think I know, but but for the listeners and the, and the viewers, what what kind of what do you mean? The harsh cough is usually a upper airway trachea, where there's sort of like a, a real hard hack and a gag at the end of right. it. So that they can do that sort of thing. You don't always see that with with heart failure dogs. Sometimes their their breathing, even at rest, is more rapid than normal. Right. You know, breathing heavier and faster than normal. And then you might hear kind of a, just a soft little um, uh, cough, little, little, like a, uh, kind of like that muted kind of cough. Yeah. Like, okay. All right. Um, but there's a definite, there's a definite difference, right? The harsh cough, there's no way else to describe it. It's just hard. Like, oh my gosh, it's like almost painful. It hurts to watch and listen to yeah, versus okay. the other one, which is like, oh, that's cute. Right. Yeah. And we don't okay. want to ignore it. And I think that's All the right. important thing is it, it may not sound as dramatic as say the other coughs we were talking about, but it might talking. actually be more, more actually, serious. Right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I also think it's important to throw out there since French Bulldogs are now the number one breed. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we should go a single episode without mentioning that. But since French Bulldogs are now the number one breed. Number um, one breed for what? Like, what does that mean? Most for popular. Most, most, for a lot of right. most popular for people. With, Everybody no, likes on. Moving them. Moving on. All right. Moving on. Everybody likes them. Uh, but, uh, so there's there's a whole lot of noise going on in the airway of a lot of French right. Bulldogs. Right. right. And so I think I think we should mention 
to folks that if you have a dog like a brachycephalic, you know, a smush face dog, like a Pekingese or or a French bulldog, um, you should really make sure that you pay particular attention to their breathing patterns during the day, um, activity levels, especially as they age, because um, it can be a little more complicated to tease out what's going on with that with that dog if they start with a with a cough. So that's right. That's a great call. Like airway confirmation, the shape of the airway, it's remarkably different across dog breeds. And that can contribute to their their tendency to have air, airway problems. Um, it, while we're on that, maybe it's worth mentioning as we move into the the sort of chronic type cough, the longer term coughs. We were talking about earlier doing a physical exam. We try to localize the cough. Well, in some smaller breed dogs, particularly smaller breed dogs as they age, they have a tendency to develop something that we um, traditionally call collapsing trachea, okay? Which sounds the- horrific. That sound sounds horrific. terrible. Yeah. That's right, it does, it does. That's right, it does. <laughs> and, and there's a couple of different things that can cause it, but basically over time, um, there can be this sort of flattening and softening of the airway, the, the trachea up here that should be a, a, a sort of a solid ring of yeah. cartilage um, and, and a little bit of muscular band that keeps the airway open. I mean, it makes sense to all of us, right? We want the airway open so that we can move air freely um, without a lot of turbulence. Like a straw. Not, like a straw. But if it starts to flatten, it actually creates more turbulence. It narrows the lumen, the opening, and it becomes harder at times to, to, to move air. This can happen in the upper airway of some small breed dogs. It, it's not exclusive to small breed dogs, but they tend to be more prone to it. And you might notice that more with excitement or if they're pulling on the leash. Um, uh, we might see it at times um, when they're inhaling at other times when they're exhaling, depending upon what part of the airway is collapsing. That's something again, that would involve a physical exam to localize where the cough's coming from. And then maybe something like x-rays to look yeah. at the airways diameter. Okay. Now, listen, I didn't know that that, like that's that that's a little bit of news to me that the that they can, as they age, develop collapsing trachea. I honestly thought it was something that usually um, the onset was when they were young, uh, maybe like a year. Uh, and, you know, really it was, was, they were, it was kind of a congenital issue. So I had no idea that they could develop that as the tissue aged. That's interesting. Yeah, but you make a good point. There, There is likely a congenital component to this. And when I say um, as they age, I mean, it's progressive. It doesn't just happen one day. It takes time for some of these changes to take place. There are congenital forms of it where they, they're born with kind of a an odd kink or what we call confirmation of the trachea. And that makes it more prone to do that. So some mm-hmm. dogs, you're right. It's from uh, extremely young adulthood that they're doing this. And in others, they may be four or five, six years of age when it really starts to worsen because they started with a normal trachea and over time it's, it's gotten weaker and weaker. Yeah. That's interesting. Huh? All right. Jason, I feel like you had a thought bubble popping over your head. No, uh, you were, you were incorrect. I had no thought bubble. I thought that was interesting. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, so we have, we talked about, um, we mentioned the heart, right? Uh, Heart disease. And I think that's always that like, for those of you out here don't know, like when we take x-rays and we have a cut, cause we have a coughing dog and we don't think it's infectious. And so we take some x-rays, like we play the game of, is it heart or is it lung? Is it heart or is it lung? Um, because it can can be be a pretty hard game though. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, and so it can be, uh, difficult to determine that. And that's when we go back in the room, or at least for me, I go back in the room and I start asking even asking more, more specific questions, questions yeah. about when yeah. the cough happens, yeah. you know, is it when they wake up in the morning? Is it, you know, do they have to stop their running after the ball so they can cough a little yeah. and then run some more? Um, so, so I just forward about- the x-rays to Dr. Stone and say, what do you think? <laughs> There you go. You can also do that. Yeah. Um, but so so if it's not heart, is there um, another sort of chronic source of a cough that you think about most often with with dogs when they when they cough? Absolutely. So it, 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 just as you said, typically the progression is we've done our exam. We've quote unquote localized the cough to not be up here in the upper airway. We think it's down in the chest. We do the x-rays and let's say there's no heart murmur and let's say the heart is normal in size on the x-rays. And there's no evidence of what we call pulmonary edema, fluid from the heart backing up in the lungs. And we think this looks more like a lung condition. There's several conditions that dogs can get, but the one that jumps to mind most commonly that that I've encountered as an internist is is chronic bronchitis. So dogs can be prone to developing um, 
chronic inflammation down in their um, the small airways of their lungs, mm-hmm. similar to people. You know, it, when we think about people, we think about asthma and bronchitis, bronchitis being the more chronic cough with mucus production and that sort of thing. Dogs can actually be prone to that too. And there's certain environmental triggers. When you overlay that with their particular genetics, they're going to be more prone to developing this. Okay. Interesting. And so, so like as, as a pet owner, when we find that and, and if I like a vet comes back in the room and they're like, yep, looked at those x-rays uh, and also had AI, look at those x-rays <laughs> and we've come back and said, it's not cardiac, it's pulmonary. And it looks like chronic bronchitis. Mm-hmm. And so as a pet owner, am I panicking? What am I doing at that point? Are we, oh my goodness. Well, a good thing we have another dog. We got an extra set of lungs. Like, what do we do with the, with the dog that has chronic bronchitis? Well, good question. So usually when we're going down that path and we're thinking it, it's something down in the lower airways, um, there, there's some, some options we have. We can do more diagnostics to try to get a little more clear picture of what's going on. So we can do things like bronchoscopy, where we actually go down with a camera and we view the, the inner airways and then get samples of any material that's down the lungs. Usually like we were talking about mucus, pus, those sorts of things. And we can evaluate that for infection, evidence of certain parasites that get deep down in the lungs, um, or just inflammation, like sterile inflammation. And that's where bronchitis comes in, okay? Let's say we've diagnosed something like bronchitis. It is manageable. It is manageable, but it does take some diligence, meaning we have to evaluate the environment for certain triggers. Is there anything that makes it worse at times? So that's going to be digging back into that history that we talked about at the whole beginning of this and saying more questions, yeah, yeah, more questions, more questions. And then there's medications. There's typically things that we do to try to reduce inflammation in the lungs, just like they do in people. So like like I'm thinking of the big gun, right? Steroids, right? That's that's right. Steroids steroids or... um, even antihistamines and um, I like, I guess, would you even go into like immune modulating um, drugs? Would, would you, would you pick some of those? So typically what happens is it's once we've gotten to the point where we see what we call sterile inflammation down in the lungs, we think it's bronchitis or or certain variants of bronchitis because they can be, you might read about um, pulmonary infiltrates of eosinophils, PIE or eosinophilic bronchopneumopathy. These are all fancy ways of saying like there's different versions of inflammation in the lungs. It's not triggered by an infection. We believe it to be um, a, an, an immune thing, like a sterile inflammatory condition. In those conditions, steroids are usually what you reach for. So it may be oral prednisone. But keep in mind, this is a chronic condition and taking chronic oral steroids, steroid pills by mouth is not a great option, right? So what do we do? Well, in, in human medicine, they, they've had a lead on this and we've since very much adopted this in, in veterinary medicine. We use inhaled steroids, like inhaled fluticasone, uh, equimethasone. Mm-hmm. There's a number of different inhaled steroids. And the nice thing about this is they're very potent and they tend to be more localized. Meaning right. if you can get your dog to use a little like arrow dog type, like spacer chamber and, and administer the medication that way, it tends to deposit most of the effects, the steroid effects down in the airways. So then or you're avoiding all those to be, right? problems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now there are challenges because with, with dogs, unlike people with people, you can inhale deeply through your mouth and get the steroid, more of the steroid down in your, your lungs with dogs. They're usually filtering it through their nasal passages. So a, a minuscule amount of the medication gets down into their lungs. Mm-hmm. But when you factor in that you're using a human medication for even a small dog, it works out. And basically what I've seen in practice is many dogs put on an inhaled steroid when they've got chronic bronchitis. They, they do show improvement. They show a reduction in their symptoms, less frequent cough. It may not completely go away. So some dogs with a chronic bronchitis will have an occasional cough. That doesn't mean that you failed treatment. It just means we're going to control it. I would imagine it's pretty tough to get the dog to, um, like if you have a, 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 if you don't have one of the small dogs, if you have an 80 pound dog who, who doesn't always want to do what you, you say, pretty hard to get them to, to, to use those inhaled uh, medicines or, or, you know, I don't have any experience in that. So have you, do they do okay with that in they general? Do, they do okay with it. You know, yeah, positive good. reinforcement goes a long way. <laughs> and, and the nice thing is even in the absence of the medicine, because these medications can sometimes be a little bit expensive. You don't want to mm-hmm. waste it. Right. Right. You could even take the little, the mask spacer chamber, put it on their nose for just a moment and then give them a treat or, or, or whatever positive reinforcement they right. like. Dogs will come to be, um, uh, accustomed to this. And it's right. not like the nebulization treatments that you might think of in, in people where they have to sit for 20 minutes. Right. That's what I was thinking, right? 100%. It's usually like yeah. 
five to 10 breaths, you know, oh, like they, that's, that's manageable for sure. Yeah. 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 All right, I mean, great news. I feel like there's probably some Labrador retriever out there on this medication who walks in the room with the breathing Loves apparatus right. on their nose saying, give me a treat, mom, I'm yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That's right. I just feel like that, that probably happens. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, so that's interesting because, um, a lot of times when I talk to clients about their, their dog or even their cat having, um, a condition where we're going to treat it with steroids, um, I just, the, the, the owner just shuts down. They're just like, Oh, I don't want to stare. And I'm like, listen, friends, steroids can do some really great things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really good at what they do. Uh, and that's the reason they can be so effective when used appropriately. Um, so yeah, I, again, I don't know who needs to hear this, but steroids are okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So do you, do you find you have it's that the conversation? Same, it's the same folks who say kennel cough. They, they, they are, it's the same group of people. <laughs> Thank you. Probably so. Mm -hmm. But um, so um, Richard, do you find that uh, the veterinarians, you know, cause like we, we talk about like the, a subset of pet owners who are just opposed to steroids. Do you find that when you talk with veterinarians about some of these conditions as well, do they just kind of cringe or recoil when you say, well, we can use, you know, an inhaled steroid. Or, or are they all like, oh, yeah, I'm on board? I think, you know, we tend to get pretty good acceptance of this because um, I think almost everyone knows someone who's had asthma or some sort of bronchitis. These, these steroids are also um, demonstrated to be way safer with respect to side effects. Mm -hmm. The problem is if, if someone interprets the oral steroid to be the easier route, like, oh, I don't want to mess with the mask and the spacer. Right. No, that was, that's really why excited. I was, yeah, that's why I was asking you because I figured it would, the dogs were probably much more accepting uh, than we would imagine. Most people think, I'm never getting my dog to take a mask because uh -huh. it's hard to get a child to do a mask, let alone a dog. But I, I agree. Just, yeah. But after a dog has been panting and thirsty all the time and woken you up three times in the middle of the night to go outside and go pee, you tend to say, you know what, right. that mask idea is not so bad. Well, what, something could... something else, right? Give me something else. But, yeah, but the yeah. other thing is uh, most dogs, I mean, they're not stupid. And if 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 this relieves a condition and makes them feel better over time, it, they're not stupid. They figure they out, oh, yeah. I feel better after I after I do that. Yeah. It, it is a positive reinforcement the, the, in and of itself. The Frenchies may not learn, or may take them a little bit longer, but most other <laughs> uh, most other dogs learn pretty quick. So. Well, they'll learn faster than the Pekingese. Okay, so yeah, let's not slam the Frenchers, right? Probably. Yeah. Okay. Um. So that those are some pretty kind of heavy reasons for that cough. Um. So let's see. The first two we talked about heart disease. Um, we talked about, um, this chronic bronchitis that might pop up and is there, is there another, any other kind of, uh, chronic cough? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I hear that, yeah. that I'm going to take from Dr. Stone, uh, the clients, I mean, immediately go to this. If it's not, if you, if you say, oh, it's not the, uh, uh, upper respiratory disease complex. The next question is, is it cancer? Is my dog mm -hmm. dying of cancer? Oh, true. Right? I don't, and, and I don't know what we did as an industry to sort of create that. Uh, or maybe that's just human nature going to the worst. As long as it's not the worst case scenario, I thought it'll yeah. be okay. I don't know, but I, most of the times I get that. I don't even know how, what the, I don't see enough patients really to see, to know what the overall percentage of a coughing dog actually translates to cancer. Probably not nearly as high as people think. I will tell you that although it does happen, so we're talking about sure. the advanced stage um, neoplasia cancer where it's metastasized. Right. So it's spread from the, the single location to regional right. lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. And then up into the lungs. Leave it to Dr. Stone to give us an entire description well, of the process. Oh, I totally. Love it. I love it. Totally. But, but you know, like that's kind of right. how, how it goes. And that's how it is. Yeah. Stage, right. Um, there's certain cancers that are more prone to doing that than others. And then the right. malignancies that we think about when we say something's malignant, we mean it's going to spread like that. Here's the unfortunate thing. There are some cancers. It's very important. If you find something like that, you address it with your veterinarian, you, you get the, 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 the biopsy or the, right. the, the tissue sent in and evaluated for, for evidence of malignancy. Those that have a tendency to spread, we don't always see a cough with that. In fact, right. we, we often have to proactively in a patient that's been diagnosed with a malignancy, do screening tests like CTE or chest x-rays to see if there's any so, nodules, any right. spread, because they don't always show a cough. Now, cough yeah. can happen when you've got very advanced spread of cancer in the lungs, but I see plenty of patients that... Um, cough isn't really in the equation and we still have to screen them because it can be silent. I mean, I, I've seen some of them, they come in on emergency and they're just, you know, they're an older pet. 
usually a chihuahua and they they have a multitude of health issues because i mean they've been around for like 15 years and i'll take a an x-ray um you know because i hear like reduced uh breath sounds on both sides or something like this Mm -hmm. and i'm not sure what's going on and i'm thinking heart disease and i put the x-ray up there and i'm like i'm not like how is that dog even breathing? Because the whole the whole entire right. lung field is obliterated with some kind of abnormal growth. And I say that, okay, it's probably cancer, but I don't know that until like I biopsy it, right? right. So, uh, but the dog was doing fine in the owner's perception the day before, literally the day before or two days before. Um, and so it can be really hard for owners to accept that you didn't do anything wrong. Right. Um, the system was compensating like it was supposed to right. the dog's okay. system. And it's just that it's been going on for years. He just didn't tell you. That's right. You know? and, but, it, but it demonstrates kind of what we were getting at earlier, which is when we see a dog with a cough is cancer at the top of the list. Certainly not, probably not the first, second, third or fourth thing that I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, they can cough, especially if it's very advanced, but more often I'm thinking about other things. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm thinking about, um, you know, canine infectious respiratory disease complex most often. And, That's and right. yeah. And maybe, um, maybe also influenza. Yeah. Which, mm-hmm. there yeah, it which... is. I almost got through a whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. We're, almost we're, we're, we're talking about respiratory disease. We, we have to say the word influenza. We have to. It's obligatory. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're, we're talking about the sun coming up. We got to talk about influenza. <laughs> I know. It, listen. Influenza is incredible. Uh, okay, so uh, we are coming to the end here. Um, so I do want to give you an opportunity, um, Dr. Stone, if you if you have any other thing that you you really like, you know, that you wish that man, I wish I wish people would just know about this, or I wish they would know about that, or they could do blank um, that you'd like to share. Now would be the time for that. Um, we'd love we'd love to hear it. Excellent. Well, hey, I want to plug what you said earlier, which is there are a number of these conditions that we can actually prevent, or at least we can lessen the severity of them. So vaccination as guided by your veterinarian is extremely important. Let's not play that down um, because there are probably many times that your dog and my dog are exposed to something in the environment. We don't even know it because the immune system is working as we expect it to. So vaccination is super important. If you're in an area that's endemic with certain parasites, particularly heartworm disease, Heartworm prevention is important. Please do that. And then I think it's a good idea just to know your pet, kind of understand what their resting respiratory rate is. What does it normally look like when they breathe, when they're sleeping and that sort of thing? That sort of observation is really helpful because it might help you catch something earlier if they start with just that little bit of cough that we talked about earlier. You're like, well, was that a one-off thing or is that something serious? You can pay attention to it. And in particular, if you see them doing that and you see more rapid, heavy breathing, you might say, you know what? I'm going to go get this checked out now. I'm not going to wait. Yes, that is. It. That was pretty concise. That was What's wonderful. What's the rest of the podcast for? Let's just have that on there. Yes, on and and I'll like I'll add like I love the pet owner that comes in and says to me, "Listen, I don't know if I'm crazy or not, but uh-huh. I feel like this is a problem because normally mm-hmm. it's like this." And you can just tell me I'm being silly, and it's really okay. And uh, I can. It's I can like tell they're you. insecure and, and don't and they're embarrassed by it. I'm like, that's crazy, right? Like that's like what I tell if, them. That's a great owner to notice those small changes. And that's, that's right. That's, that's what you say. Listen, you're the best yeah. owner ever. You notice those tiny changes that where another owner might not, right? That's fantastic. And we love to not find problems. I mean, yeah. to yes. be honest, we love to not find terrible diseases. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, I love them. I love when they come in and they're like, I don't know what's going on. It's this weird thing. And I'm like, it's a reverse sneeze. And it's exactly. totally okay right. because here's how you know it's okay yeah. and here's how you're not. And I say, gold star, best owner of the day. Right. That's but right. I also love the ones who's, who will say to me after I do my physical, I've listened to the chest, I've done all the things. And, um, and even if they, if they say, well, I, I really could sort of, could, you know, yes, let's do x-rays. Okay. Take the x-rays. Everything is good. Um, and they say, no, but there's still just something. There is something. Not, I feel not, like it's something. Off. Yeah. yeah. And I say, okay, let let's, Let's go and like, like, let's now let's go down the path in a stepwise fashion. You know, you know, your pet better than, than anyone else. And, and so I, I love the owner that's, that just insists to me, I get it. I know, but I feel like there's something and is willing to, you know, to take the, the, the journey with me to let's sort it out. Right. Like, that's great. That's what we're supposed to do. Right. When we're charged with their care, that's what we're supposed to do. So, um, so this has been a wonderful discussion of when a cough, 
may not be just a cough. Um, and I'm so grateful, um, Dr. Richard Stone, that you were um, available to join us uh, again today. We love, love, love having you in the chat room. Um, and, and I hope that you'll be willing to come back. Of course. Always enjoy it. Thanks all. All right. Well, um, that's, that's all I have, Dr. Jason. Oh, I thought you were going to forget about me. No, that's all I have. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So get your coughing dog to the vet if you've got one and, uh, we'll catch you all in the next episode. The Professional Animal Care Certification Council, or PAC, brings independent testing and certification to the pet care services industry. Is your dog's daycare or boarding kennel or a groomer manned by PAC certified professionals? Don't know? If you don't know, you gotta ask. Look for the PAC emblem at your facility to make sure that your pet's receiving the highest level of professional pet care. Because we all know it's safer in a pack. Your PAC CE code for this episode is CC220085. This episode is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements, the leader in digestive health for dogs, cats, and horses.